I don't know if I have to begin again. <laughs> okay. As, as I said during this session, we will visit different aspects of autonomous vehicles. The two first speakers, Professor Gier Summer and Dr. Christopher Eslenbach, both from the University of Vienna, will focus on automated mobility and inclusion of people with mobility disabilities. The next speakers, coming also from Austria, will be uh, Dr. Bente Noll and Professor Jos Hauger. Uh, they will talk of the components of the automated mobility system, considering aspects of the pre, on, and post trip, including aspects such as general infrastructure or legislation. The third presentation, it will switch the topic from the characteristics of the passengers and overall infrastructure to the study of driverless cars behavior by analyzing a specific concept, the traffic flow. Dr. Akito Higakani will defend this work. The last speaker of this session, Dr. Solaz, will concentrate on the overall picture of what exactly may the consequences be in this transition from drivers and occupants to just passengers. I hope you really enjoy the contents of the presentation. You can use the chat to formulate any questions to the panelists at this session, and they will be collected and I will address them at the end of the session. So, uh, get started. to get started, I will give the floor to Professor Gier Summer and Dr. Christopher Eslenbach. Gier Summer is Emeritus Professor at the Institute of Transport Studies, and Christopher Eslenbach um, is a postdoc researcher at the Institute of Sociology and is expert in the participation of vulnerable users groups in the traffic system. <clears throat> so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, dear friends of social inclusion in mobility, we are happy to present you the results of the Austrian National Research Project, Automated Mobility and Inclusion of Mobility Impaired Persons, the abbreviation AM inclusive. We means in this case that the presentation is made jointly with uh, by Christopher Schlembach and myself. I hope that Christoph is also online, I think so, so that the change over to the second part of the work will uh, not create any problems. My name is Gerd Sammer and I will start with the topic current situation and perspectives of inclusion, requirements and mobility impaired person. Next. Christoph, next. The presentation of the result of the research project Automated Mobility Inclusive is so extensive that it is divided into parts. This is immediately followed by the second part, components of an inclusive automated mobility system and recommendations. The main objectives of the research project for the mobility and transport uh, sector are first, analysis of the potential and effects of automated mobility and digitalization for equal opportunities and inclusion in Austria. Second, identification of possible negative systematic effects and exclusion of person groups. And third, involvement of stakeholders from planning and economy, as well as people with disabilities in the development process. Next, please. The importance of inclusion in mobility becomes clear when uh, we are looking at the proportion of the people excluded from mobility. We distinguish three main groups of perceived mobility impairment among the Austrian population. 3% are severely mobility impaired. These are those persons who in practice already receive some consideration in mobility planning today. 13% are severely or moderately mobility impaired. This is 10% more 
who are practically not sufficiently taken into account with regard to inclusion. This includes, for example, persons from immigration background with learning disabilities and so on. Finally, a total of 38 includes all mobility impaired persons with severe, moderate or mild impairment. This is also includes, includes mobility impaired single persons, persons with risk poverty and so on. A comprehensive view of mobility uh, impaired from the subjective perspective of those affected shows that this number is far greater than the we have defined in most national legislation. The figure four now shows the estimated estimates of the people in Austria by different groups and extent in really perceived mobility impairment. These groups are divided into uh, subgroups showing the existing governmental support to overcome specific mobility impairment in the categories A to E, with intensive support to no support. Overall, from a legal point of view, Group A and B received sufficient support from policies, but in practical implementation, there's still a big gap today. This is not only due to lack of financial resources, but in many cases also due to a lack of knowledge and engagement on those responsible persons. Next picture, please. No, uh, please one back. A great hope for solving the current lack of support for people with mobility related impairment could lay in the possibilities offered by the technology of automated mobility and digitalization. The question arises whether this can really be true. Automated moving pavement and automated lifts and escalators, for example, are not new uh, mobility offers. Despite the long distance, they still cause many problems for people with impairment today. Drones, for example, the next please. Drones uh, are a very ambivalent technology whose use in personal mobility is very questionable. Very important are the new technology opportunities for the pre-trip generation preparation and information about mobility offers, as well as the automated registration ordering and payment of right requests. The on-trip service, such as automated continuously updated information, individualized information for users and the stops or in the vehicle, and the post-trip service for automated post-treatments and realized trips, mobility behavior for persons' feedback and complaints. Next, please. Now, what are the main important mobility requirements of people with impairment? In principle, these are identical for conventional as well as automated and digitalized mobility. But the first tests of automated mobility show that these principles are far too little taken into account in practice. Because of lack of time, I limit myself only to the needs of following groups of often neglected impairments, which are hardly taken into account in mobility planning. It's people with learning difficulties. They request easy to understand language and texts and alternative offers to smartphones, apps. People with mental illness, they need space for retreat and quiet zones, areas free from sensory overload, to avoid panic attacks, etc. People with chronic enteric disease, they need functioning public toilet facilities, for example, and people with multiple impairments, they request uh, inclusion of the two sense or multi sense principle. Uh, how I hand, now I hand over to Christopher for the second part of this presentation. Good. So get this 
described in some kind of, I must say, pioneer pioneering work, the situation of people with disabilities in Austria, but what's the future and which futures are implied in the uses of technology and infrastructure? Um, in part of a project we did together, we analyzed some um, imaginaries, so visions of the future, of the past and the present, and what we see is that in a way the future didn't change. So in the 50s, of course, you had the the idea that the highway is everywhere, but you have the metropolis still in the background and in the foreground is the driving car driving to some place where the, maybe the, the observer is standing. And this seems to be true in the other picture which you see on the right hand, where you have a Navia uh, automatic bus, which Navia is a, a European manufacturer who is do, doing pioneering work in, in uh, automatic driving, public transport for the most part. And of course, the, the, the in-between, space in between the observer and the metropolis is now um, a green space. It's used for, it's, it, this is kind of, the po this is the post-industrial society, in fact, which you see. But if you look closely to the little figures uh, there and to the people, um, inhabiting these places, there, there are no disabilities. People with disabilities do not appear in the picture. And also hardly, uh, there is also hard, that is also difficult. So the racial differences are also not implied, but disabilities are not part of the future and the past and the present. And this is, in a way, this is the problem we have when we talk about disabilities uh, in connection with in relation to uh, automated driving. So, of course, when we we did we, we did kind of SWOT analysis where we see it just presents some opportunities, the aut automated mobility offers, but also some threats. So, increased traffic safety is of course, and for especially for people with disabilities, of course, a big uh, opportunity, a big positive thing. For for automatic driving, uh, which implies then opportunities for participation in social life, increasing technology acceptance in a way could be an effect, a positive effect, cost reduction and efficiency increase of municipal services, development of fields of activity and business models which improve inclusion. So there's also some promises for the economy and expansions of good good practices of inclusion to other fields of activity because the realm of traffic is in a way uh, the, the place where most social life happens. But the threats are also not to be neglected that user requirements for vehicles and operation points are not considered. So new barriers to accessing information are also implied. There might be higher traffic volume, especially due to increasing automated Private motorized transport is the biggest problem in a way in looking at the development of, uh, of the traffic system. Technology skepticism, partly induced by job losses, might arise. Financial overburdening, who pays all these services and the maintenance. Selection of suitable first test users is important for the implementation of process if you do not uh, take care of these processes adequately. And was also might happen the situation induced fears and stress in the use of uh, new automated mobility services. For example, if there is no operator who can help you, then you might shy away from using these um, robots in a way. So when we <clears throat> take it a higher from a higher perspective from the from the perspective of societal evolution, inclusion in fact takes place, but it's a long-term and it's a slow process. So on the level of society, legal norms, which are based on uh, on human rights, this is the, the last reference point, um, are taking place, these processes are taking place. There is also, we see also a move away from treating people with disability in terms of illness. So this would be the medical model of illness and we move to a much more social and political model of illness, which says that barriers are made by society and it's not the fault of people 
disabilities, but there is also some development to say that people with disabilities are just normal people, the normality principle, but this is more part of the future. Stakeholder groups and lobby groups are developing. The strongest are, of course, those for, the, for people, for blind people and those who use wheelchairs. So they have strong lobby groups, but those, for example, with cognitive disabilities or with mental illnesses, they are still underrepresented in public discourse. And we also see uh, interesting processes in the economy. It's called adaptive upgrading. This is old Parsonian language so that um, situations are also accessible to, to people, to persons. This is an adaptive problem. It's an economical problem in the last place. Um, and the design for all movement uh, is trying to, to solve this issue in an inclusive way. Yes. We, in, in the project we did together, we uh, uh, distinguished between a number of strategies to strengthen inclusion, strategy of, of expansion, the use, for example, the use of automated vehicles in public transport, catching up uh, um, strategies, for example, inclusion oriented adaption of the test procedures for the approval of automated mobility or the adaption of the professional profiles of public transport employees. So these combine in a way weaknesses and chances of in a SWOT, from the SWOT analysis. Avoidance strategies, uh, for example, develop frameworks for the inclusion of persons with disabilities in technology development. So to avoid exclusion by inc including people in the development processes already and hedging strategies, for example, preventing people with disability from being put at risk by automated mobility. Um, except, yes. So different kind of strategies are needed in order to foster uh, inclusion in the traffic system for people with disabilities. So to come to just some conclusions, Automated mobility has a high potential for inclusion, really high potential, but it will not develop automatically. We need an inclusive vision, like you could, I always talk about the vision all, which could complement the vision zero of traffic safety. We need a sufficient knowledge base so that the problem must also be brought to the fore in terms of numbers and statistics, uh, where Gert did uh, much work in Austria already. We need participative design processes involving all stakeholder groups and not only the physically handicapped persons because they already are very strong in the discourse but also other groups of people with disabilities and the most important um, measure or factor is that political enforcement is necessary by developing legal frameworks to standardize affordances for vehicles and infrastructure so I stop here. Thank you. I hope I'm, that we are in time. Thank you uh, very much, Christopher and Ger. Next presentation is for Dr. Dante Connol. Uh, he has a quite impressive bio uh, is, they sent to me. So I will just uh, highlight uh, he holds a master's degree in landscape planning and architecture and a PhD in transport and traffic planning, and a certificate in mainstream gender and diversity in organization. So uh, please, Dente, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Um, and also many thanks for having us here from, and uh, for the opportunity that we can share our results of a study with you uh, in two parts and I'm very happy that uh, Gerd and Christopher have already set the ground, so really the baseline for our study. And um, I want to talk now in the next um, upcoming 10 to 15 minutes about uh, the components and also about uh, requirements that are needed and are part of an inclusive automated mobility system and I will also talk about uh, recommendations 
that we developed uh, for the Austrian um, landscape, for the Austrian environment. Let me um, first of all point out that um, our um, study that we um, are happy to present uh, today to you is a study. It was not really a research um, project, but it was a study commissioned by the Austrian uh, Ministry of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. So it's really seen as a uh, research and development service. So we received a contract and uh, we received also a quite defined um, research agenda and uh, also expected results. So it, it was really one of um, our main uh, goals to develop um, recommendations that are useful for the uh, political, um, for the politicians and also for the decision makers here in Austria. And uh, let me start uh, with just a short um, input on our definition of automated mobility. Uh, in our uh, project, we understand automated mobility um, uh, to, is understood to mean uh, the increased use of uh, information and communication technologies, technologies in uh, the mobility sector quite general and broad. So uh, in our project and also in our upcoming um, recommendations and components of an inclusive uh, mobility system, you will learn that we understand automated mobility not only um, for the vehicle um, sector itself, but also um, it's um, embedded in all areas of transport and mobility. So automated mobility is really not only about vehicles, but also about, for instance, the technical support that supports uh, people uh, on their journey, uh, on the pre-trip, uh, on-trip, and also on the post-trip um, area and stage of uh, journey. And uh, to understand uh, what's our background of uh, inclusion, we uh, referred to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, uh, especially to the Article 9, uh, that is dealing with accessibility issues. And uh, we really, and you can see that what uh, Christopher has pointed out, that we really um, embedded a quite uh, broad vision and um, definition of uh, inclusion in our uh, work and in our study. So it's really um, about, uh, inclusion is about enabling persons with disabilities to live independently and uh, they shall um, be able to um, live in all aspects of their life uh, and also um, transportation and information and communication is also a crucial part where people um, shall be enabled to live independently. And uh, as you can see in the definition, also uh, the state parties who signed the uh, respective um, UN convention um, are responsible for. And uh, this is just to inform you that in Austria in uh, 2008, uh, Austria has uh, signed that specific um, convention. So it took just a couple of years that also in automated mobility issues, this uh, perspective of inclusion has been brought up. Well, and uh, with the increasing automation and uh, digitalization and networking, um, we can see that there is an opportunity that automated mobility and uh, in, quite in, in general, so let it be automated uh, public transport systems or automated um, micro public transport systems, automatic car sharing, but also automatic private cars. Uh, it's quite sure that these um, technologies will form an innovative automated network and inclusive mobility. So they um, have really a huge potential. Uh, but it's really necessary when we uh, take into account the perspective of uh, people with impairments that uh, it's necessary to guarantee a seamless and also inclusive mobility chain from door to door. 
So that uh, really means the different um, perspectives and um, of people with impairments are taken into account. And what we know from our study, and we also included um, several groups of people with impairments in our participatory study, and we learned uh, really a lot of people with, um, impair with impairments and disabilities that mobility barriers occur today. So it is um, a matter of fact, and it, it is also um, a fact of the day-to-day uh, -day, um, journeys of people with disabilities that they um, face and that mobility barriers occur. And it's really needed when we uh, think about future technologies that uh, we really uh, take all those um, um, crucial needs into account. And when it comes to, for instance, uh, pre-trip requirements, it's uh, really important uh, to have a close look. Um, is it possible for people with impairments to uh, get all the information needed um, about the automated mobility services? Let it be ordering or booking payment processes. So are these um, ICT processes are really these ICT um, processes ex uh, accessible for people with different impairment. And that also goes on to the on-trip requirements. So um, are there barrier-free access for people with disabilities to the automated vehicles at all stages of the journey? So that's really uh, very important um, to take these um, perspectives into account when designing automated mobility. And uh, in the on-trip uh, stage of a journey, then it's really uh, important uh, to think about a journey starts when people leaving their front door. So it's really necessary to um, take a very close look on, on the perspective of the trip chains. Uh, that uh, for sure also includes um, social um, adequate financing of um, automated mobility services, so that uh, really these automated mobility services are services for all citizens, according to the UN Convention. And um, on the, in the stage of the post-trip and post-trip requirements, uh, it's really important that the experiences of people with disabilities who have um, used the automated mobility system, that these experiences are also taken into account and are, are considered um, as uh, complaints of other people are considered. So it's really important that uh, there is a feedback loop to the operating company, that uh, operating companies really take um, the experiences of people with disabilities into account. And there is one um, um, well aspect I want to highlight, and it's also dealing uh, or has a very huge um, gender impact. So it's uh, quite important to uh, take, well, take that um, perspective also from the gender lens into account. And uh, it's about uh, the, um, when it happens, um, in what happens in cases of emergencies. And it's um, really important that I just go back to my next slide because that it's um, uh, kind of a really the, the overall um, uh, cross-cutting issue of our components that we really always uh, take into account the, what happens in cases of emergencies and that uh, it's really important to focus all kinds of impairments. So to give you a practical example, um, for instance, in case um, of um, a sudden stop um, of, um, let, let it be an automated um, public transport system, uh, then we have to take into account uh, the different um, needs of uh, people with impairments. And uh, for instance, um, uh, a person who is um, hearing impaired um, has other um, necessities than um, a blind person. So uh, people with hearing impairments, they need information on time uh, in, for instance, sign language. And uh, people who are blind, uh, they have access to the 
common quite in, in, uh, in the day-to-day -day practice in the uh, common information channel that is used in case of emergency. So uh, normally information is provided via loudspeaker and uh, when it really comes to an inclusive and connected and automated mobility system, it's necessary that we take all different uh, kinds of impairments into account. And that also um, means that uh, people with disabilities are also part of the technology development, that they are really um, seen as um, active participators in development processes. And uh, as uh, different components uh, of an ideal inclusive automated uh, mobility system, we uh, developed in our uh, study eight different components. Um, due to the time, it's not possible to dig into detail of uh, into all of those components, but I think the uh, graph is uh, quite clear that it's really a um, holistic approach is needed and that we do not only take the perspective of the vehicle or of a car into account, but also uh, uh, we are talking about environment, organization, that means also uh, the business entities who are, do, who are the operators um, of automated uh, mobility um, systems. We also have to think about uh, coding and uh, about inclusive regulations, standards, and uh, also funding. So who has access and who can um, afford different automated mobility services. And uh, as I mentioned before, we um, it was uh, a contract. Uh, we were commissioned by the um, Austrian um, Ministry, and uh, we developed um, precise recommendations for uh, the Austrian Ministry. And um, we first of all point out that it's highly needed to raise the awareness. Uh, of the topic mobility of people with disabilities. So that's really a topic that is not taught uh, in uh, at universities. It's not part of um, a training civil servants um, undertake when they become um, decision makers in the ministry, for instance. And it's also very important to integrate the gender dimension um, when we do uh, awareness raising. Uh, legal framework, as I mentioned before, it's important to involve people with disabilities also in testing environments and to develop new technologies together with people with disabilities. So really to um, work with people with disabilities, not for them, uh, but with them. So really, and, and that is uh, also something where the um, decision makers, um, let it be um, the, the public ministry or also research funding organizations um, play a crucial role because they um, develop the framework. Um, then when it really comes to uh, the service and to automated mobility services, uh, in order to ensure that these services are really inclusive, it's important and that is really one of the main results of our uh, study, that people with disabilities, they need a human fallback. So that is really 100% necessary for an automated um, inclusive system that we include human fallbacks. So that is, um, and uh, in fact, uh, that would also be, um, would also need that we maybe talk about the different uh, levels of um, automatic mobility we all know. So we have to think about, is it really, um, um, well, an aim or, or an objective to reach the uh, level five um, in the next decades. Um, then uniform standards and norms that also uh, integrate uh, the perspectives and the needs of uh, people with um, disabilities is needed. So it uh, has a, something to do uh, with barrier-free entries and exits and so on. And um, last but not least, uh, 
next to the um, raising awareness and all those uh, political uh, recommendations, it's also needed uh, that we promote research in the field of human-machine interaction. So we have to learn more about interaction of people with um, disabilities and um, technologies. So that's a really a high uh, important recommendation that we include people with disabilities, but uh, also take the gender dimension into account. And uh, let me uh, finish my talk with, um, on one hand, thank you, and also um, with a citation of our study, uh, Automated Mobility Inclusive. Uh, it is only available in German, but uh, in case you uh, want to read it, we are happy and uh, also provide the link. Um, we will be happy to provide the link in the chat box. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Bente. Next uh, speaker is Aikido Higatani. I don't know if he's in the in the room at this moment. Uh, so, I'm afraid uh, he's not. So uh, can you can you check can you check the emails because uh, the the following speaker uh, uh, just in case he has not received or is in the other in the other room so i will okay. give the floor okay, i will you, give the floor yes if you want to send me the email i can send again the the link no no I, I i don't I, I don't know the the email of no, uh, because uh, fuentes i think uh, he wrote uh, already so maybe we can start with jose yes uh, what I was asking to you is to check the mail of Akido uh, Hidakatani. So next uh, speaker will be Jose Solas, Dr. Jose Solas. He's, he has a PhD in mechanical engineering and he has worked for several automobile companies. Since 1994, his, his work is linked to the field of ergonomics and human factors and his last work deals with the interaction with the new autonomous vehicles technology and how it will impact on the human behavior so uh, please the floor is yours thank you uh, ricard and um, i hope you can see my presentation can you yeah yes ricard, can you yeah cool so thank you um, and my conference will be uh, somehow uh, open and the main goal is to to talk a little bit about how we are dealing from driver and occupants and as you see in the first slide so uh, the the concept of automatic vehicle is something quite old but um, let me go to the topic when we talk about autonomous, autonomous vehicles so we most of us we think about completely autonomous vehicle but um, probably most of you are familiar with the five levels defined by say about what's an autonomous vehicle so from no automation at all, level zero, to full automation, level five, there are several degrees and technology is going to be developed to reach different levels of, of automation. From driver assistance, that's the, probably the one that you have in your cars, to uh, uh, semi-autonomous or partial autonomous vehicles, the conditional automation, uh, and the high automation in which you say the car goes from A to B, and then the car is able to drive automat automatically in a certain environment, for example, in a traffic jam or in a highway. So to reach that, uh, and, and the reason why uh, uh, we, we deal with, with uh, autonomous vehicle is based in several factors. So there are societal factors, like the, uh, getting uh, old of the population. There are more people living alone. We are more connected. We are more dependent of technology, of the economy. So the appearance of crypto money, the blockchain, economy threats, and uh, finally, some technological, obviously, uh, innovation like the avatars, nanotechnology, user-sensitive uh, artificial intelligence. So if we put together all those ingredients, so we have the keys of which will be or can be the future of the autonomous vehicle. So basically, the vehicles in the future should be more sensitive, more intelligent, more connected, environmental friendly, and public. So each one of those concepts is quite complex and is going to be developed during the following years but uh, we don't really know 
what will happen in the future. What's very interesting about autonomous vehicle is that uh, it can be very useful, really, uh, for long trips uh, in the road when you have to, to recover long distances. And uh, in a study made some years ago, people talk about the things that they can do inside the vehicle. So if you if you read that, so probably think that people is doing it right now. So you, you keep it doing it, but in a safer manner because of the car, which is control instead of you. When uh, thinking about autonomous vehicle, uh, manufacturers think on different scenarios, different possibilities, like obviously sleeping, uh, chatting or, or, or sharing during a trip. But you know, most of the scenarios that they design are quite ideal. And as you see, they are great cars, perfect cars, most of them, you know, driving in all alone uh, roads with people that between 20 and 35 years old, you know, like probably like not all of us. There appear new problems when we go to the reality of autonomous vehicle. So when you try to sleep and eat with somebody, you need some intimacy. Uh, uh, maybe you want to socialize in some cases like you see in the scenario number six, or both users can sleep, or one can be in private and the other needs to eat. So let's think in the autonomous vehicle, like not really something that you want to use by yourself in an ideal world. So we probably are thinking in shared vehicles in which concepts like safety, security, intimacy will appear. So the ideal world developed by engineers maybe is not that ideal when we go to the real scenarios. Again, going to the engineer, so we have fantasies about what, what would be like the autonomous vehicle. So we, we're thinking about something, you know, very technological, so very, you know, full of light, something that will permit us, you know, something like living in the future. And and indeed, there are, there are plenty of new technologies that might permit that, but that nowadays are not that developed. So the fully autonomous vehicles are still so far because some situations are not completely solved. The way in which people drive is, you know, is quite different of what an, a robot or autonomous system drives like. Besides, there's a plenty of cultural uh, background that make us really different from one country to another. The need of including biometric access or biometric measurements to know about the user also opens a new question about privacy, sharing data. It's interesting to know more about the health monitoring, and and you know probably you will be plenty of hours in a in a in a, in a system that can be accident prone. So it's very important to know where where the user is and how the user is in order to let them retake control when they need to. Besides, we're thinking about a car in which there will be new tasks to do. So we we need, we need reconfigurable body panel with great reconfiguration of, of the vehicle in time. So that's not easy to, to solve and, and opens uh, a plenty of new problems. So we are not thinking in a, in, a, in a car as we are thinking right now. Something that's been forgotten and I think that's interesting to, to deal with is that who is behind the wheel? So you know manufacturers think mostly on a person till 50 male when they design the cars. So, although there are some interesting initiatives like the Volvo one, like the EVA initiative, that talks about uh, equal vehicles for all, in which the the, 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 the sex in, is introduced, in the concept of defi defining safety, unfortunately, that's not that normal. And, uh, and still, we are thinking autonomous vehicle designer for uh, average male, which is a it's a big mistake for different reasons, but uh, one of them is because of the wide variate, variety of uses and, the, and, and manners of interacting with the vehicle that people has. Uh, some years ago, before pandemic, we had a session in Milan in which we tried to imagine potential uses or potential use cases So, um, of these autonomous shared vehicles. And things like a family with parents, a kid and a pet, and the same car to be used by a professional woman traveling for work during the night, for a meeting in the morning, or a scenario in which a rental car for several colleagues in a trip for a company has to be shared, so they have to eat, they have to sleep, they have to rest inside. Thinking also in cargo delivery trucks in which you, you have 
two or three workers that you know they, they, they need to you know uh, to, uh, uh, to to be working at the same time and delivering packages so they have to get in and out of the vehicle and finally the most extreme case in which uh, an autonomous car can take four different people perfect, perfect strangers that need their intimacy and they don't need to be necessarily friends or the same age so these new scenarios appear and they will make the concept of autonomous vehicle more and more complex as we approach to the real uses and the real life. All these concepts and the real use has a plenty to do with acceptance. I mean, are we willing, are we open to use this autonomous vehicle? If some of some people and, 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 and I explained that autonomous vehicle will tackle most of the problems related with safety. So there'll be less crashes because they, 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 the vehicles will, will behave in a manner that they understand with each other. They will take our place in driving when there's a problem or, or uh, with a crash or probability of crash. So they can stop boredom, they can reduce drowsiness, they can make uh, plenty of things, but still we need to trust in them. We need to trust in our robot in some manner. And uh, again, with uh, with trustworthiness, uh, there are interesting differences in in sex and in gender. So uh, um, it, it, women are less enthusiastic than men about their prospects of driverless cars. So as I mentioned before, it's supposed to bring fewer deaths, but uh, again, we used to be blind to social issues like gender parity and diversity. Uh, the, con the, the companies need to consider women's concerns about the technology. We could be exacerbated by worries about personal safety and lack of accountability when there is no driver present. So if uh, manufacturers of cars still think in a male perspective, they are, you know, they're, they're, they are losing a plenty of info that, that will increase acceptability. As I mentioned before, the risk for the women is much higher uh, to be seriously sure than men, and and in that sense, as I mentioned before, even though we have the EVA example, uh, it's not clear that uh, there are, there are uh, more approaches than, than, than this. Uh, in the same uh, uh, sense, uh, I mentioned before that in the, in the ideal world, we think that you will have your you know your autonomous vehicle, but you know in the real world probably the, the cost of the vehicle will be really high, so you probably need to share the vehicle, and um, sharing means saving, or mostly when you're considering a car with so much technology that would be really expensive. So this chart shows, which is the uh, save with car sharing instead of uh, purchasing a vehicle. So probably if you, if the cars become more and more complex, more and more expensive, and more and more autonomous, the idea of sharing cars could, pre could prevail on having your own vehicle. But there appears again another uh, topic, that's the expectancy versus reality. So you, in an ideal world, you expect that somebody like, you know, an, uh, uh, you know, already, uh, elegant woman driving the car, you know, in a very fancy manner. But in reality, if you share a vehicle, probably people use it like in their normal life. They will carry their dogs, they will eat on the vehicle, because as I just, you saw before, people want to eat in the vehicle. You know, they, they rent the car for an excursion with the family, so they, they will use it in a normal, you know, scenario. I don't want to extend much more, I, I just to I uh, want to let some topics op open for reflection. Um, what I try to summarize in some manner here in this slide is that the autonomous vehicle need to overcome the uncanny valley. Uh, like in the Bukimi no Tanigetsu, that's the, that, that the, that the problems uh, that uh, were shown in robotics in which there's a relation between the affinity or the likeliness of a robot compared with a human likeliness, uh, which you see in the chart in the in the in the left. So the the higher the graph is that you feel more uh, uh, compatible. You you like this technology, and and the lower the value is that you 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 
deny you don't want to have this technology. So the human robots are well accepted, but if you go too far and you are not able to to go through this uncanny valley, so you probably will have a solution that is too near of the perfection but suddenly falls because there's a technological gap between your nowadays technology and your object, objective. So if you go farther than you can do, you probably have something that's completely rejected. We thought that something similar can happen with autonomous vehicle. Nowadays, you use ADAS, like lane departing warning or front frontal, uh, frontal collision warning in your car, and you're very happy with it. But if you go a little bit far and you expect that your vehicle is like, you know, completely autonomous and it fits for, with you, being men, women, or children, or any kind of family, and it is not. So there will be a crash in that technology, and all the work done until now will be completely lost. So. We need to take gender issues in, in, into consideration. We have to consider who is a real user, why is going to use the vehicle, and put the user at the center of the autonomous vehicle. Otherwise, we will fall in the uncanny valley, and we will lose all the advantages that the autonomous vehicle might have. Thank you for your time, and I'm open to any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. Uh, so next we will open the floor to Akito. Uh, so uh, please, um, the floor is yours. No. Uh, Mr. Higatani is uh, has a PhD in civics civil engineering and an important experience in maintenance, construction and traffic management of mm -hmm. expressway in Japan. And the floor is yours. Thank you. And you share your screen, Akito. Do you have any problem? No. Okay. Okay, oh, perfect. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you can, can you can you show my presentation? Yeah. Uh, right now you are showing your screen with uh, the program go to meeting. So maybe you have to change to the PowerPoint or PDF. Mm -hmm. Have you the PowerPoint presentation open? Yes. So you have to choose your screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation? No. No. Oh. Do you have two screen? No. Okay. And Please open the. Do you have your presentation open? Okay, I. That's that's it. Oh. Perfect. Oh, okay. okay sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi. This is Akito Higatani speaking in Japan. So, I'm sorry. I'm I'm late. So today's presentation title is the the impact of autonomous vehicles on traffic flow. So nowadays, the dramatic progress of ITS makes auto driving technology highlighted. A Toyota, which is one of the biggest car manufacturers in, is in the world, made a presentation about the future image filled with autonomous vehicles named e-palette, for example. So it can be said that people are enthusiastic about the term autonomous vehicle. People will become free from driving and people do meeting or having a break or reading newspaper in their vehicles, like a second house. And such a situation like a dream will achieve in the future. 
So, well, uh, this is the main question of this study. So, do autonomous people have a good effect on the congestion? So, the answer to that question have not been found out even now. Some people say, yes, of course, there will be no congestion in the future. But other people say it's not always, sometimes worse. So, in this study, we investigated the impact of autonomous vehicles on traffic flow using micro simulation model. So this is a micro simulation network. So it is created using BESIM. So network is 5.5 kilometer and two lane, and it has three merging sections. This network reproduces a part of Hanshin Expressway network to Osaka City. So this route to Osaka City has one of the severest con traffic congestion in this network. The maximum traffic volume of this line reaches over 46,000 vehicles per day. And the lane changing model is the internal model of BESIM. And the car following model for human is IDM Plus. And this is IDM Plus. S yes, uh, here, so S. Yes, Asterisk is a dynamic desired gap. It is calculated every 0.1 second. And A is uh, the maximum acceleration. And B is the desired deceleration. And T is the desired time gap. The feature of this model is the nonlinear response to speed differences. So this model is quite robust and use a friendly model to simulate human driving behavior. And the car following model for autonomous vehicle is Heli FSC model. And this is Heli FSC model. And Heli model is a simple model. So vehicle acceleration is controlled by the distance gap and the speed difference like this first equation. In this study, we gave a little update to Heli model. The concept of sensor detection range and the enhanced brake function and the speed and acceleration regression uh, was introduced in this model. And every autonomous vehicle has a time gap setting. It is represented by T. A time gap setting of autonomous vehicle has four patterns like these, very short setting and short, middle and long. And in order to set the ratio of four types of time gap control setting, we calculated the ratio of time gap setting by using this graph. This graph is made by using real vehicle trajectory data in this network. So this figure shows the distribution of the time gap and the three seconds for 50 minutes. The mean value is 1.55 seconds, and that is the value of the desired gap for human drivers in this simulation. And from this distribution, we estimated the ratio of time gap setting of autonomous vehicles. For example, uh, in the very short setting, we picked up the number of 1.1 second and 1.2 and 1.3, and I thought out the numbers, and the number is 2,812, and then calculated the ratio of each setting, 33% and 29 and 24 and 14%. Then, oh, sorry. Oh, then using the micro simulation model and the data I mentioned, we evaluated uh, traffic congestion in 10 cases. From number one to seven, percentage of autonomous vehicle changes. One is 100% and number seven is zero percent. And the maximum acceleration of autonomous vehicle is 0.6 meter per second square in these cases. The value is smaller than that of non-autonomous vehicle, so which is 1.4 meter per second square for human drivers. In case number eight and number nine, uh, maximum acceleration of autonomous vehicles changes from 
0.6 to 1.4 meter per second square. In case number 10, maximum acceleration of, of autonomous vehicles is still 0.6 meter per second square, but the time gap setting of all autonomous vehicles sets to be very short setting. So this is result. And the traffic congestion is evaluated by total loss time. So this equation. So loss time is calculated by this formula. And Q is traffic volume, and V is speed, and VR is regulation speed, and L is length of the section. According to the results of case number 1 to 7, so loss time clearly increases with the percentage of autonomous vehicle rising. That's because the average desired time gap of autonomous vehicle is around 1.7%. Uh, second in this simulation, so which is longer than the no autonomous vehicle's uh, desired time gap, which is 1.55 second. An autonomous vehicle's speed recovery after the speed re reduction uh, so was slower than no autonomous vehicle's speed recovery. So because the maximum acceleration of autonomous autonomous vehicles was set to 0 0.6 meter per second square. And comparing the resu results of case number five with case number eight, uh, this one and this one, and the percentage of autonomous vehicle is same, 25%, but loss time of case number eight is smaller than case number five. In case number eight, the maximum acceleration was changed from 0 0.6 to 1.4. On the other hand, comparing the results of results of case number eight with case number nine, the so loss time of case number nine is smaller than that of case number eight. That's because the maximum acceleration was changed from 0 0.6 to 1.4 and all the vehicles are automatic vehicles in case number nine and the heli FSC model so that is a car following model for automatic vehicle is better at accelerating than IDM for us so in other words if enough automatic vehicles are in the network uh, increasing uh, maximum acceleration makes a significant contribution. And finally, so traffic congestion didn't occur in case number 10. So because the desired time gap setting of all the vehicle was said to be very short, that means they follow their leading vehicles with very short, short time gap. So autonomous vehicle accelerates slower than non-autonomous vehicle uh, because of the maximum acceleration, so which is 0 0.6 meter per second square in case number 10. In spite of that, reducing average time gap seems to have more powerful impact on traffic congestion than increasing maximum acceleration. So this is conclusion and the discussion. In this presentation, we investigated the impact of autonomous vehicles on traffic flow using micro simulation model. Then we found that autonomous vehicle doesn't always have a good effect on the congestion through the case study. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Akito. Um, okay. Fortunately, we have gone uh, run out of time, but I think uh, your study was uh, interesting to to at least question what is uh, what is the. Um, we assume that with autonomous vehicles, we will gain traffic flow, better traffic flow, and putting numbers and a model uh, functioning, we we get that it may be not always the case. From the organization, mm -hmm. they said to me, 
that uh, we have the possibility to to make um, some questions because the other session goes also with some delay. So I don't know if if you want to add you if there is any question uh, or if some of you after listening to the other panelists you you want to to add something to what you have already said. Okay, so the first presentation, you talk about disability and it's a long time. I come from the field of the disability, not, not related to mobility, but to or, uh, architectural, urbanistic or other types. And, and I, I, sometimes I have the feeling that we are always in the same, uh, we are running, uh, coming back to the same place of, of uh, to the beginning point, no? let's say. So uh, from uh, from this aspect, uh, what would you think would be the, the key element that in 10 years time or 20 years time when maybe we have a lot of automated mobility on the road, there is not still this gap between the opportunities of mobility for people with any kind of disability, um, people with don't have uh, these sort of added added problems. I don't know if Bente, you, you can give your opinion on that. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree. So that's uh, also uh, something that I face in, in my work for, for years, that it really seems that we discuss about the same issues. Uh, again and again and again. Um, that's why we were very happy that uh, we got the contract uh, and really also the um, well the agenda to develop um, policy recommendations. And we really tried to point out that it's really needed that uh, the standards and norms they really have to be implemented and they have to be um, also addressing the needs of um, people with disabilities and in fact that um, we also have um, formulated that as a recommendation that people uh, with disabilities shall be active users in testing environments so in, in fact it is it, but in, in fact it, it's it's the problem it's the problem in Austria in other countries all over Europe so that uh, public money is spent for testing environments without including people with disabilities and from my point of view that's a political decision and in fact it's under the responsibility of public funders let it be ministry when it is national money or european commission so it that should not be the case anymore and from my point of view the regulations the the the, the legal framework it's already here it has to be implemented into practice and that is um, a responsibility of decision makers we from research and from the consultancy we know what people should do but we are not in the um well we are not the, the decision makers we can only uh, recommend we can only uh, give advice we can develop guidelines there are lots of guidelines out there so it's really a political decision that these um regulations really come into place they are forced and we also have to discuss about what happens if um some research project or the industry does not stick to the regulations but that's also a political discussion. So sorry for being so strict on that. I want to add some a few comments for that. Uh, you must be aware that the legal framework is okay if we consider the European level, but it's not uh, so well done if we look to the national level. In a lot of countries, that's the same in Austria, we have some specific uh, framework which uh, which is shows the future for for example uh, people with uh, blind people and so on but not for the whole range of impairments and that's very important that we uh, increase 
the improvement of the political framework on the local level. Uh, and the second issue, and it is uh, familiar with that, is the question of awareness. The awareness of most of the people dealing with uh, planning issues. That's also a question of education at the university, I must say, uh, to my own uh, society. Okay, we have a lot of gaps in this issue. Thank you. Uh, another point, probably uh, Dr. Salat can uh, extend a little bit, is about the acceptance of the vehicles, or autonomous vehicles, in in the sense that there are also um, different attributes that make uh, that make easier or makes other and put other difficulties to to accept the autonomous vehicle. Uh, he was comparing the and uh, with the robotic or I thought about personal ro assistance and uh, robotics and and I he drew this graph with the cure that maybe we have too high expectancies about what could be the the future of the autonomous vehicles we when we find that they do not do what we expect we think they are not good enough or i don't know if dr solaz is still connected yes i am yeah i lost the, the camera um i think that uh, we're going to see uh steady development and in, uh, incorporation of the functions of the autonomous vehicle. So we are involved in several projects with companies uh, with tier one and, and OEMs. And the idea is to incorporate the functions in a sort of uh, level two, level three vehicle at the first stage. So um, level two an autonomous vehicle mean that the vehicle will be autonomous driving in some places, but you have to be looking at their function. So people don't want that kind of, kind of product, they will pay for something that they can do because they have to be aware. Level three means that the vehicle can take the control, but he can call you to take control again if he finds a situation in which the car don't know how to react. That might mean that you can be, you know, completely looking at another place or you can lose control. So manufacturers right now are into something like, it's not really uh, the name, but something that will be between level two and level three. That will be useful to know if the acceptance is increasing, is growing. So they've introduced probably that like a package, like they introduced safety uh, at the moment of the, of the comfort package, like, you know, like an extra product. So I think like the, in the case of ABS, or in the case of the, uh, of the ESP, so we will see functions of autonomy that will be little by little be incorporated, not, not to crash and, you know, and, and, and to lose the op big opportunity. But, and they have to, you know, the, 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 the cover, the still the, 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 the acceptance of those solutions. So I, I think there will be maybe steps. Um, I'm sorry, we have to close the session. Thank you, you to all the speakers for this wonderful presentation and what you have shared with us. Um, we have a lot of more questions and, and things to do, but now it's time to, to regroup to the uh, general session just to, to close uh, this uh, today and uh, working in, in this seminar. Thank you very much. Time Thank to you. go back to the uh, you, to the session. Join. Thank you. Bye. To meet all of you. Bye. Thank you. You have to use the same link, okay? Okay. Can you maybe uh, share the link in the chat? Uh, no, it's the, the personal link that you have oh. on the okay. webinar. Okay. Okay. Thank then you. I'll check my mailbox. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.